Thank you guys for having us today. I have been using uh, AnyLogic for quite a while, so it's uh, great to be at the conference and see the, the product and the conference growing over the years. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing Mosum Tech because my coworker Jeff Brelsford is going to talk a little bit our, about our company later. I just want to uh, introduce our presentation because uh, we've actually got two projects in one presentation. John and I met at the AnyLogic conference in Philadelphia, which I believe was about three or four years ago. 2015. 2015. And several months later, we got a call from uh, Walmart saying they needed someone to evaluate John's technology, because uh, we didn't quite know if those spreadsheets could be trusted. And, and John even admitted there are some areas in Excel that uh, weren't quite adequate, and we could really get into a simulation model and, and more fully evaluate the technology. Um, so this was three years ago. Mosum Tech came in, and we had seven weeks to help Walmart make a go-no-go -no -go decision on this grocery technology. Um, and then after that, uh, Christian took over the model and has since been adding more and more details to it advancing the model, turning it into a true engineering design tool. Um, so I'll cover the, the first project phase that we did three years ago, and Christian will get into the more recent details. But John's gonna, gonna take you guys through just the technology. <clears throat> uh, I describe myself first as an inventor, and now as an entrepreneur. Uh, as an inventor, I got interested in supermarkets in the mid-90s as an opportunity for innovation. Um, and I started envisioning a supermarket, a store in which robots or automation, I didn't know that the robots at the time would, uh, fill orders automatically for uh, customers, eliminating the need for humans, the customers, to walk up and down the center uh, aisles of a, a center, the center store aisles in a supermarket, uh, which would work really well for packaged goods. But as a customer, I want to be able to pick my own peaches. I don't look for the best looking box of cereal, but I do look for the best tomatoes, the no bruises, and so forth. One's not the same as another. So I want the system, this is a thought experiment at what would be the perfect store for a customer. And it would be one in which I could have machines pick the orders that uh, I don't care about picking the individual product, but let me have the choice. But I also want to be able to order those uh, online too. This was before the internet, but I, I was imagining uh, uh, catalog uh, software on my PC that would phone over a modem uh, and, and have the order uh, fit ready for me when I arrived at the store. Uh, this idea sort of took over my life, and, and I couldn't, uh, because what I realized was that with an adequate automation system, it would be more profitable for the retailer as well. Uh, the problem that I discovered when I started actually looking at automation solutions is that it was totally impossible, it wasn't even close, would require something far more advanced than existed at the time. Uh, and um, I couldn't let go. It, I decided that this was worth putting uh, effort into. If I could solve this problem, uh, it could uh, change retail. And so uh, I started working in automation, and I'm not going to give you the, uh, or put you through the pain of uh, joining my journey over uh, the next 20 years, but I'll just jump forward to 2015. Uh, I was working with a co-founder and co-inventor, Bill Posnight, uh, and we in, uh, came up with this design solution. If you look in the, uh, just behind the decks the, where the robots are moving in two dimensions, you'll see the, the robots can go up and down. So the breakthrough in this design is a robot that can not only act as a two-dimensional mobile robot, but can position itself at certain locations in the structure that we call towers and actually engage opinion gear uh, and uh, elevate itself up and down. And so it can move to any storage or workstation elevation in the system. And this breakthrough allows us to eliminate all conveyors and all lifts and have one, the only moving part in the storage and retrieval system is the robot. We had another moving part at the workstation, but you can see that the robots are actually the mechanism that moves through the workstation. Because it can move vertically, it can elevate and present to the picker. So we have robots that are bringing products to the pick station. Another robot brings an order container, and the picker is transferring the products to the order, uh, from the product containers to the order containers. And this is the solution that lets us put a, ro a robotic material handling system into the center store uh, of existing uh, supermarkets. Uh, and this was the concept that we presented to Walmart. Walmart was looking for a solution to be able to automate online fulfillment at, at store level, 
And uh, we showed them this, and they got very excited about it. And uh, they wanted to build a, a tool to evaluate it because they didn't, as Amy said, they didn't trust my spreadsheets, and uh, neither did I. So um, uh, I gave the reference to Mosin Tech um, to bring them in as the, as the solution partner because I wanted to use any logic, and I convinced them that if we built the tool in any logic that we could preserve the value of that tool by uh, extending its capability and making an engineering support tool, uh, and that's what we've done. So uh, we, we brought uh, Christian and Bill. We hired a great team. We have just an amazing team. We've developed this technology in record time of two, two years. We're now uh, uh, piloting at uh, a super center in uh, 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 Salem, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, uh, Christian is part of our team, so he became a simulation engineer, and we've used it, as Christian will describe. So this is uh, the addition onto the uh, super center in Salem, New Hampshire. You can see the, the cars come and, and park. This is, these are images of our system inside the facility. And this next animation, I mean, next video is a composite video showing what life looks like to an Alphabot inside uh, uh, the system. Uh, the lower left hand is a stationary camera. You can see them moving on the decks between uh, storage, the storage aisle they're coming out of, and they're going into workstations. Uh, the other images are images from cameras. We've got six embedded cameras in the robot. Uh, a lot of these images from, were from a, a 360 degree uh, camera that, uh, was, so we can pan and show. So this is uh, what, what uh, the system looks like in operation. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll turn it over to Christian to, oh, oh I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> to Amy to talk about the kickoff. Thanks, John. Um, so just I'll go through the phase one very quickly. Um, as we mentioned, Walmart needed to make a go, no go decision. And this moved very quickly. Um, I think we got a call on a Tuesday um, from a Walmart executive. And they asked us if we could be in Boston on Monday. Um, and so I think from that point until we needed to come back and give final results, we had seven weeks for specification, model development, testing, analysis. Uh, developing a report. Uh, so we, we had to move very, very quickly. Um, one of the things Walmart really wanted was a tool that was flexible enough to handle multiple sizes of stores and customer bases, uh, which was a really uh, strong positive for AnyLogic because we do feel like it's one of the best tools out there in terms of runtime flexibility. Um, and Walmart wanted that not just because, you know, they wanted to look at their current, you know, what's my immediate question, but eventually as this tool continued to grow, uh, they knew it could be used for sizing future stores and determining which markets were most attractive for an Alphabot system. One of our unique challenges was, you know, the system didn't exist yet, um, which structurally we could think in terms of, you know, how high are the racks, how, how wide are the aisles, uh, but the control logic didn't exist. So when an order comes in and we have multiple bots, who gets it, how do we prioritize orders, how, how far ahead do we call orders so those loaders are staying busy without creating too much congestion. Uh, so we had a lot of whiteboarding exercises to say, well, what would that level of control logic look like? Uh, we did avoid, however, the detailed congestion modeling, uh, which I believe is what a lot of Christian's follow-on work was about. We took the approach of let's be pessimistic. You know, let's assume one robot in an aisle at a time uh, so we don't have to worry about collisions. And we knew that would be pessimistic uh, because we didn't want to overpromise Walmart anything that the system couldn't actually do. Um, so in terms of inputs, um, they had complete flexibility to define their demand, whether that would be lines per order or each is per line. Um, the bots themselves, uh, we could look at their speeds, um, acceleration, deceleration. Uh, we have this concept of a speed derating factor. There is one area of the system uh, where bots were traveling, and we knew there could be some congestion factors, but we simply did not have the time to build out that detailed collision avoidance logic. So while my partner, uh, Sarab, was building the main model, I built a side model using the road library, where we could kind of mimic what we thought this area might eventually look like, and we developed a congestion to speed derating curve to eventually feed back into the main model. Um, and I think the other input that's unique about this one is simply the fact that they could go in, uh, they could change the number of tiers, the number of aisles, how deep the aisles were. Um, they could change all the physical components of this system. 
Um, so just a quick demo of that, that phase one model uh, where they could come in, change their things in Excel, hit the run button. A very, very simple dashboard came up. We did eventually have to add a basic 3D animation. Um, there was some concern that this looked so simple, people would think it was just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so we, we, did have to, um, we did have to put the 3D animation in there, but as you can tell, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, but what is nice is this animation would scale. If they said, you know, I want 10 aisles or four aisles, uh, they could physically see in the animation that it would scale appropriately to what they put in. And then once the model is done running, um, we'd get the outputs back into Excel where they could look at detailed log files, summary tables, or charts and graphs. Um, when we were running our real analysis, we had another mode of running this um, where we would launch off huge batch runs and get summary files so we could do more detailed scenario analysis. Um, this is one of our, our summary slides that was shared with Walmart. Um, and you can see I have a quote from last summer that showed up in Yahoo Finance. And I was, I was tickled to death to just see this come across my LinkedIn feed, uh, that they were quoting the, the computer simulation models. But the slide in the background, these were our original predictions that 95% of orders can be picked in under eight minutes. Um, I was recently telling some of my girlfriends about this technology, and they said, well, that'll never work. I'd have to have my order in five minutes. And I said, you can. <laughs> um, the average time was actually under five minutes. Um, and then the, the quote from Yahoo uh, shows that the, new, the newer simulations are showing average pick times of three to four minutes, and I believe that's because Christian and the team have been optimizing all of that control logic and optimizing those, those collision avoidance logic. So the original model was, was pretty accurate, um, but they have been able to continue to squeeze the system to get it even faster. Thank you, Amy. Um, so um, as both of them have pointed out, um, we're still using the model um, that was uh, implemented in the seven-week rush um, at that time. Um, but the focus and the purpose of the model have changed quite a lot. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, evolving such a model over more than two years, um, there isn't much that's still left in the model as it was before. Um, but still, it was uh, great to start from a running model and just be able to um, increase the level of detail of certain aspects um, as it was necessary throughout the development. So um, we're, we're not uh, looking at the binary decision um, that uh, Mosentech was looking at before, but at a uh, uh, supporting tool for the actual development uh, and design of the system. Um, so starting from the actual model, as you've seen before, um, we needed to put in uh, uh, more specific um, logic for the bots moving, um, the bots reserving their paths in the system to avoid uh, collisions of the bots, uh, including movement profiles um, done in a uh, conjunction between uh, built-in AnyLogic um, agents and uh, own Java uh, functions. Um, to be able to also uh, include uh, acceleration and deceleration, for example. Um, we're separating temperature zones, and um, most recently we've put in the inventory tracking, so uh, the model is uh, now able to actually track every each that is um, put into the system and uh, picked into an order and taken out of the system again. So just to give you a comparison um, to the uh, of the model, come on, yeah, here we go. Um, what, uh, the, the model, it, uh, what it looks like today. Um, so as you can see, it's quite a complex model uh, in the meantime. Um, you can see uh, bots of different colors moving around. Um, they are doing, doing different kinds of tasks, um, planning that path uh, as indicated by the colored lines, um, reserving uh, points on that path indicated by the dots on the lines, 
So as a big um, complex thing, it uh, sometimes look like, looks like a 3D uh, Pac-Man game as the bots eat up their, their dots. <laughs> um, you can also see the bots temporarily parking on the decks. Uh, so we've also included the sorting on the decks so um, to make sure the eggs are the last thing uh, that's put into the order bags at the end um, so we don't crush them. Um, and uh, we had a little concern about the um, performance degradation that might come from uh, that specific aspect, but uh, so far it turned out that um, it doesn't really impact the performance um, to, uh, uh, or it's, it's a rather ne negligible. Um, so just to give you a few uh, examples of what we've used the uh, model so far, obviously to uh, design certain layout uh, alternatives um, for specific locations, um, but uh, for the whole development process it was uh, extremely valuable to have the model ready um, to, uh, as a support tool for certain development decisions. Obviously, there were um, specifications in the beginning uh, for things like uh, bot speeds in certain areas. Um, but when you go through development, uh, some specs turn out to be achievable pretty easy. Others are pretty hard to achieve. Um, so we all always use the simulation to see uh, how far do we need to go with certain um, uh, specifications like um, bot speeds in certain areas? Do we really need to achieve the actual uh, original specification or is something slower um, still enough to get the performance of the system? Um, we've also used it to size the capacitors of the uh, bots as we're not using batteries but uh, super caps um, and was uh, important not to size them too, uh, too small. And uh, maybe one uh, example that uh, we saw in, this, in, in the simulation that's actually uh, originally a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so we realized that if the bots um, just go orthogonal on the, on the decks, um, if they have to turn, they just go orthogonal, they stop, they turn, and they uh, move on. Um, that's the original idea, and uh, the, uh, the, um, there was an idea to increase the throughput of the bots uh, through the decks by uh, making those uh, turns radius. Um, but it turned out that that wouldn't really help the uh, actual performance um, of the system. So we were able to really um, cut the development uh, efforts in that uh, process uh, and focus it on, on different things uh, where the performance uh, increase was uh, larger than uh, through the radius turns. Um, so as we have this model um, and uh, the first uh, system gone live uh, earlier this year, um, it's interesting to see where this whole technology will go in the future. And therefore, I will hand back to John to give you an impression of that. All right. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> so now that we have the robots, uh, they're in pilot, they uh, exist. Uh, uh, we uh, are certain that we can now uh, automate a supermarket. So this is an animation uh, that shows what the uh, store could look like. It's a two-building structure. The, the, the store itself in this animation is only 17,000 square feet, which would be roughly the size of a Trader Joe's that has about 4,000 products for sale. But uh, because we're leveraging uh, vertical height, we can build all of the packaged goods. The center store, effectively, is all automated with an Alphabot. And so in this same footprint, we could very easily build a store that would be more typical of a 70 or 80,000 square foot that store that might have 50 or 60,000 uh, products in it. Uh, and so we're reducing the footprint of the store very dramatically, uh, as well as the parking lot, because now people uh, will spend much less time at the store because they're only shopping for their fresh goods, not their packaged goods. And many uh, customers will choose to order everything in advance and either have it delivered to their home or pick it up. And so they're occupying a, a parking space for uh, just a few minutes. And so. Um, uh, this allows a very dramatic increase in sales and assortment on a, combined with a dramatic uh, reduction in, um, in footprint, uh, total real estate costs. So this is the animation 
People um, come to the store only really because they want to either pick up their order or they want to shop the fresh market. They can order their packaged goods in the store. We can have screens and, and uh, we can put that at, at uh, ADA, AD, ADL uh, level for people who have trouble uh, standing up. Uh, so we can serve all customers. The reason for bringing them to the store, for the, the, the retailer wants to bring uh, customers to the store because that's going to be their lowest cost of service and they can stimulate additional sales. You'll see uh, a cooking demonstration in a bit. We want the store to stimulate uh, people to be hungry and buy more food and get inspiration of what, what they want to buy. There's no checkout. You saw some uh, uh, ATM looking machines. Those are checkout kiosks if you have to pay in cash or with a credit card. Uh, otherwise, you pay on the phone. The phone becomes the shopping uh, terminal to show what they're buying uh, in, in real time. They can change their mind, whatever. Uh, so this is, this is celebration food. This is experiential retail. This is customers, you know, we, we're taking advantage of a, of a, of a very well-developed uh, survival instinct of wanting, people want to eat, people love to eat. And so shopping in the fresh market is a... Uh, is an exercise in planning uh, what you're going to cook for dinner and, and providing for the family. So we're we're leveraging that, but people they don't have to come. They can order everything uh, if they want. The beauty of this model is that it serves uh, the people that want to uh, uh, select their own fresh as well as those who uh, don't care and would would rather have either a human being selected from the floor or we can prepack the fresh and put it in into the uh, robotic system. So this is, in this model, we would hand off on a conveyor. It'll actually be a little bit more refined. It'll be actually handing directly to a robot. Um, but we, we encourage retailers to allow the customers to uh, connect to the, to the automation. So this is the same animation I just showed uh, being uh, put uh, into effect in, in the store. Um, the the, the uh, pickers won't be quite as uh, exposed as this, but this, th I think it's important to show uh, customers how the system works and make that connection. The cool thing about the robot, because it can move vertically, we can let it leave the building and actually deliver uh, to curbside. So we can actually uh, hand, uh, present the tote to the customer and they can uh, take the, the bags out of the tote. I want to extend now and, and use any logic to model the store, right? And so the agent-based capability of doing that is, uh, I want to be able to model what customers do, what the store associates are doing. I, I want to build the store in virtual space before we actually build it in physical space. And, and the combination of different modalities in any, any logic, I think, uh, will lend itself very well. It's, we're going to have to make our best guess how customers uh, re, uh, are going to behave, but by building in a feedback loop, it, we can refine and, and start testing what is the benefit on bot count if we, if the retailer encourages more customers order in advance so we can pick their order before they get to the store and we don't need to be delivering that three or four average minute uh, fulfillment. And so, um, you know, getting into complex questions like how do we design the store, how do we lay out the store, uh, I think those can uh, be very effectively answered in simulation uh, rather than real world experimentation. Anyway, that's, uh, I think that's it, right? So thank you very much. Okay. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Are there any questions or? I like it. <laughs> oh, I, let, me, let me just make one point. I want to make one point. Uh, because it, it gets to our relationship with Walmart. We're, uh, we need to be very careful. This is our vision of future store. I don't want anybody to interpret that that's necessarily Walmart's vision. So uh, we, we're not collaborating uh, yet with Walmart on the Nova Store project, just on the Alphabot uh, as a fulfillment, automated fulfillment. I think that's important to understand. Okay, any questions? Mm. One question. Yep. Uh, well, I, I can go first. I already have the mic. So, uh, first of all, congratulations. I think this is a great project that you have. Uh, my name is Miguel Campos from Georgia Tech. We're also working like kind of large scale simulation models. And uh, there's a lot of things I find interesting, but I wanted to ask like uh, two questions. I'm, I'm brand new in Analogic. This is like my first year working in Analogic. I've worked with simulations before. But I wanted to know, first of all, um, how, how the, the actual results of the implementation can be compared to those of the simulation? Because these are really interesting cases in which you build the model first, but then you went and implemented it. So I wanted to ask, like, 
how how can you compare like the results you had before and after? That's actually a pretty pretty good question. Um, so uh, we started with a system that wasn't existent uh, at that point. Um, uh, but uh, I've been in very close contact to the um, uh, MCS group, uh, so the material control uh, uh, system that are actually developing the, um, uh, the uh, bot logic uh, or implementing the bot logic. Um, so it's supposed to be pretty aligned with the actual system, um, but uh, that's, uh, to be honest, a point we still have to, uh, to do to validate the um, simulation results to actual system uh, behavior and system performance. And very early on in the first project, um, Alert had very extensive Excel spreadsheets. So we, we use those as kind of our base case. Let's compare the model to the spreadsheet. Um, we like to think that the model was more accurate than the spreadsheet. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a really good uh, validation exercise, because we at least had a ballpark idea of what these systems could do. Um, and it was an opportunity for us to say, when the model is different, why is it different? Does that make sense? Would we expect that difference, you know, given the difference between the Excel spreadsheets and the simulation model? Um, so I think that's a pretty general exercise we go through a lot with systems that don't exist yet is you know, doing a side calculation of what you would expect and then trying to determine why the differences are there. Are they explainable? Who do you trust more, the Excel spreadsheet or the simulation model? You know, getting everybody in a room to discuss um, if everyone feels that the results of the model are valid. Uh, uh, let me uh, just say a couple of words. The, the system it is, as it exists today in, in the real world uh, is very, very close to what we were, what you saw in the animation. In fact, we like to talk about how we, we, we take animation to automation uh, very well. And um, uh, so the, and part of that's because we, I'd been with Bill Fosnay, we'd been working on this for a long time. So we had already thought through the system design uh, to a good deal. The decision support tool became very important as Christian uh, uh, described for design, uh, making very specific design decisions. But uh, the, the initial simulation tended to also validate the spreadsheet uh, estimates uh, pretty well, too, in terms of bot count. That was a critical one for the capital expenditure required. Uh, but my estimates initially were uh, a bit low, but we had a contingency built in uh, to allow for the uncertainty and the, the uh, 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 simulations and now uh, presumably actual results we'll be getting uh, are uh, pretty indicative or conform fairly well to the spreadsheet. So, um, the, the, the tool has been tremendously useful, but it, it always helps to have a really well thought out uh, system design before you start, uh, so that, it, it, that, that made a big difference. Um, Thank you. Uh, just another quick question. That maybe it's not like a smart question, but I don't know how question. to do it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, how, how did you connect the analogic with the Excel? Like, you develop the add-in yourselves, or, or how? Yeah, that's an add-in that Mosum Tech uses. Um, it's great for quick projects. You know, I love the, the private cloud and the custom uh, user interface. And sometimes we do more complicated user interfaces for um, ongoing applications and multiple users. But in this case, um, that Excel add-in is something that we kind of have on our shelf that uh, we can just grab and go. Um, it's it's a any logic templates, a lot of VBA um, that's just been built up over the years with multiple people contributing and, and refining it. Um, so I would highly recommend, um, whether it's Excel or anything else you use, um, just kind of building up your base of any logic and reusable, uh, reusable code that you can use from project to project. Thank you. Yes. I would welcome a store like that because the sort of the trend of the plus stores and the super stores, I mean, you're, you're foot sore by the time you get in there and then you've got a quarter mile loop around the inside of the store to, to get all your shopping done. But you know, there's so much of the grocery store business that's built on having a store that size and the you know, manufacturers paying premium prices for certain locations and end caps. Can you just talk a little bit about yeah, yeah, like the, the, the business of you know how, how does this become more profitable or is it like a niche location, let's say a downtown which doesn't have a lot of space? 
Thank you. Well, real estate is a problem anywhere, even in suburban locations. So being able to put smaller stores closer to customers is, is going to be beneficial. But the, uh, the, the I, I thought you were going to go to impulse buying. What about people just have, you know, you lose that impulse if you don't have people walking around the, uh, the, the sh and seeing the shelves. But all of the, the interaction of the customer to the, to the store now is digital. And so you have, still have the opportunity to stimulate incremental purchases, but it'll be digital. And you still have the option for incrementing, uh, uh, incremental uh, impulse buys in the store. But uh, to my mind, you know, uh, uh, impulse buying is a secondary decision. The, the decision the retailer needs to win first and foremost is that they come to their store. So if you have a better experience for customers, fundamentally, they will come to the store. The, the, the relationship with the, with the manufacturer and the retailer remains the same effectively. Um, um, I think it'll, it'll tend to put more of a focus on, of retailers on making money by selling to customers rather than taking money from manufacturers. But you still have the opportunity for virtual end caps, for presenting uh, advertising and promotion to customers uh, for a fee. So there'll still be uh, some of that. I, I think it'll um, uh, change the economics of retailing fundamentally uh, very much uh, uh, in favor of the retailer of making the store a lot more profitable, of being able to, you know, the common metric of sales per square foot is now going to be just a wholly different scale because we got so many fewer sales, uh, square feet and so much higher sales. So I think that all of the economics of retail uh, get better. And once you automate the store, then it becomes much more straightforward to automate the, the supply chain that feeds the store. So uh, we, we see a, a dramatic transformation in retail economics. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Alan Barnett from Golden Research Labs. We also are doing quite a bit of work in the retail space. I was just curious about the scope of the project. The other big wicked problem in retail is making sure you don't have avoidable shortages and surpluses. And I'm wondering whether that's going to be part of the scope in the future or is it already in there to, you know, testing new advanced uh, algorithms to make sure that you don't get avoidable shortages and surpluses? Well, the biggest... Uh cause for out of stocks and, and, and shortages on the shelf have to do with the uncertainty of the data. They just don't know what's on the shelf. And, and that's a serious problem in online because it, it, they, retail not knowing for certain what they can make sure that they can provide means that they're offering uh, products for sale that they can't be uh, guaranteed that they will have. And, and uh, uh, substitutions is a very high, is the highest source of dissatisfaction for online customers. And so be, with our system, one of the side benefits is that we track every product by the item that goes in. So we have a real-time, perfect, nearly perfect inventory. Uh, and by making the entire supply chain a single machine, we can guarantee that when we uh, uh, commit an, uh, uh, an order to a customer that we can have it uh, uh, available when, they, when it's ready to pick. And just a follow-up question, is it uh, linked specifically now to Walmart, or are you also looking at other retailers? Because obviously this is a generic problem within the industry to solve. Right. It, it is. It's a big world. We, we're focused on Walmart right now, but our vision is that this will become available to everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.